On May 10, there was a great change in the condition of the sea. There could be no doubt of my longitude now, if any had before existed in my mind. Strange and long-forgotten current ripples patted against the sloop's sides in grateful music. The tune arrested the ear, and I sat quietly listening to it while the spray kept on her course. By these current ripples, I was assured that she was now off Scent Rock, and had struck the current which sweeps around that cape. The trade winds, we old sailors say, produce this current, which, in its course from this point forward, is governed by the coastline of Brazil, Guyana, Venezuela, and, as some would say, by the Monroe Doctrine. The trades had been blowing fresh for some time, and the current, now at its height, amounted to forty miles a day. This, added to the sloops run by the log, made the handsome day's work of one hundred and eighty miles on several consecutive days. I saw nothing of the coast of Brazil, though I was not many leagues off and was always in the Brazil current. I did not know that war with Spain had been declared, and that I might be liable right there to meet the enemy and be captured. Many had told me at Cape Town that, in their opinion, war was inevitable, and they said, The Spaniard will get you, the Spaniard will get you. To all this I could only say that, even so, he would not get much. Even in the fever heat over the disaster to the main, I did not think there would be war, but I am no politician. Indeed, I had hardly given the matter a serious thought, when, on the 14th of May, just north of the equator, and near the longitude of the river Amazon, I saw first a mast, with the stars and stripes floating from it, rising astern, as if poked up out of the sea, and then rapidly appearing on the horizon like a citadel, the Oregon. As she came near, I saw that the great ship was flying the signals C, B, T, which read, Are there any men of war about? Right under these flags, and larger than the spray's mainsail, so it appeared, was the yellowest Spanish flag I ever saw. It gave me nightmare some time after, when I reflected on it in my dreams. I did not make out the Oregon signals till she passed ahead, where I could read them better, for she was two miles away, and I had no binoculars. When I read her flag, I hoisted the signal no, for I had not seen any Spanish men of war. I had not been looking for any. My final signal, let us keep together for mutual protection, Captain Clark did not seem to regard as necessary. Perhaps my small flags were not made out. Anyhow, the Oregon steamed on with a rush, looking for Spanish men of war, as I learned afterward. The Oregon's great flag was dipped beautifully three times to the spray's lowered flag as she passed on. Both had crossed the line only a few hours before. I pondered long that night over the probability of a war risk now coming upon the spray after she had cleared all or nearly all the dangers of the sea, but finally a strong hope mastered my fears. On the 17th of May, the spray, coming out of a storm at daylight, made Devil's Island two points on the lee bow, not far off. The wind was still blowing a stiff breeze on shore. I could clearly see the dark grey buildings on the island as the sloop brought it abeam. 
No flag or sign of life was seen on the dreary place. Later in the day, a French bark on the port tack making for Cayenne hove in sight, close hauled on the wind. She was falling to leeward fast. The spray was also close hauled and was lugging on sail to secure an offing on the starboard tack, a heavy swell in the night, having thrown her too near the shore. And now I considered the matter of supplicating a change of wind. I had already enjoyed my share of favouring breezes over the great oceans, and I asked myself if it would be right to have the wind turned now all into my sails while the Frenchman was bound the other way. A head current which he stemmed, together with a scant wind, was bad enough for him. And so I could only say in my heart, Lord, let matters stand as they are, but do not help the Frenchman any more just now, for what would suit him well would ruin me. I remembered that when a lad I heard a captain often say in meeting that in answer to a prayer of his own the wind changed from south-east to north-west entirely to his satisfaction. He was a good man but did this glorify the architect the ruler of the winds and the waves. Moreover, it was not a trade wind as I remember that changed for him but one of the variables, which will change when you ask it, if you ask long enough. Again, this man's brother, maybe, was not bound the opposite way, well content with a fair wind himself, which made all the difference in the world. On May 18, 1898, is written large in the Spray's logbook. Tonight, in latitude 7 degrees 13 minutes north, for the first time in nearly three years, I see the North Star. The Spray on the following day logged 147 miles. To this I add 35 miles for current sweeping her onward. On the 20th of May, about sunset, the island of Tobago, off the Orinoco, came into view, bearing west by north, distant 22 miles. The spray was drawing rapidly toward her home destination. Later at night, while running free along the coast of Tobago, the wind still blowing fresh, I was startled by the sudden flash of breakers on the port bow, and not far off. I luffed instantly offshore, and then tacked, heading in for the island. Finding myself, shortly after, close in with the land, I tacked again offshore, but without much altering the bearings of the danger. Sail whichever way I would, it seemed clear that if the sloop weathered the rocks at all, it would be a close shave. And I watched with anxiety, while beating against the current, almost losing ground. So the matter stood hour after hour, while I watched the flashes of light thrown up as regularly as the beats of the long ocean swells, and always they seemed just a little nearer, it was evidently a coral reef. Of this I had not the slightest doubt, and a bad reef at that. Worse still, there might be other reefs ahead, forming a bite into which the current would sweep me, and where I should be hemmed in and finally wrecked. On 
I had not sailed these waters since a lad, and lamented the day I had allowed on board the goat that ate my chart. I taxed my memory of sea lore, of wrecks on sunken reefs, and of pirates harboured among coral reefs where other ships might not come. But nothing that I could think of applied to the island of Tobago, save the one wreck of Robinson Crusoe's ship in the fiction, and that gave me little information about reefs. I remembered only that in Crusoe's case he kept his powder dry. But there she booms again, I cried, and how close the flash is now. Almost aboard was that last breaker. But you'll go by, spray, old girl. Tis a beam now. One surge more, and oh, one more like that will clear your ribs and keel. And I slapped her on the transom, proud of her last noble effort to leap clear of the danger, when a wave, greater than the rest, threw her higher than before, and behold, from the crest of it was revealed all at once all there was of the reef. I fell back in a coil of rope, speechless and amazed, not distressed, but rejoiced. Aladdin's lamp, my fisherman's own lantern. It was the great revolving light on the island of Trinidad, thirty miles away, throwing flashes over the waves which had deceived me. The orb of the light was now dipping on the horizon, and how glorious was the sight of it. But, dear Father Neptune, as I live, after a long life at sea, and much among corals, I would have made a solemn declaration to that reef. Through all the rest of the night I saw imaginary reefs, and not knowing what moment the sloop might fetch up on a real one, I tacked off and on till daylight, as nearly as possible in the same track, all for the want of a chart. I could have nailed the St. Helena goat's pelt to the deck. My course was now for Grenada, to which I carried letters from Mauritius. About midnight on the 22nd of May, I arrived at the island and cast anchor in the roads off the town of St. George. Entering the inner harbour at daylight on the morning of the 23rd, which made 42 days sailing from the Cape of Good Hope. It was a good run, and I doffed my cap again to the pilot of the Pinter. 